Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing heterotrimeric G proteins and adenylyl cyclases. Okay, so we've just discussed uh, that uh, when you have G protein coupled receptors, which, uh, when activated by their ligand, activate heterotrimeric G proteins, which have a um, either a G alpha S or a G alpha off uh, alpha subunit. Uh, then these uh, G alpha S and G alpha off uh, GTP subunits will then go off and activate any of the nine adenylyl cyclases. Okay, and the way that they do this is by binding to the C1 domain and also to, to the C2 domain and pulling them close together, and this then promotes the dimerization of the C1A domain and with the C2. Um, a domain uh, to produce an active enzyme which can then convert ATP into cyclic AMP and pyrophosphate. Okay, right. Uh, so we now want to discuss other actions of other subunits of heterotrimeric G proteins on adenylyl cyclase enzymes. Now, next what we want to discuss is the inhibition of the activation by calcium uh, on the adenylyl cyclase 1, 3, and 8 uh, by uh, members of the G alpha I slash naught family. Okay, so before we can discuss this, what we need to discuss is the activation of these adenylyl cyclases by calcium. So remember, adenylyl cyclase 1, uh, 3, and 8 were all in this group 1 adenylyl cyclases, okay? So they were grouped into group 1 together, which were the calcium-activated adenylyl cyclases. So all of them are activated by calcium, and I just want to discuss the mechanism for adenylyl cyclase 1 and 8, okay? So if, let's start with adenylyl cyclase 8, because adenylyl cyclase 8 has a rather interesting mechanism, okay, of calcium activation. So, basically, adenylyl cyclase 8 does not have a, a binding domain for calcium actually within the protein structure. So, the adenylyl cyclase itself doesn't have a calcium binding site, so it needs the help of another protein uh, to actually bind to calcium. So, basically, what's going to happen is the adenylyl cyclase 8, which I've drawn here, uh, is going to bind to another protein, which in turn will then bind to calcium. And this other protein is going to be calmodulin. So, what I want to do is just have a brief discussion of the structure of calmodulin for a moment. So basically, apocalmodulin is the strict name for calmodulin when it has no calcium bound to it. And it has a structure like so. So this is calmodulin with no calcium bound to it. And the strict name for that is apocalmodulin. Okay, so basically, apocalmodulin has these two lobes called the N lobe and the C lobe, like so. And both of these lobes have two calcium binding sites. So the N lobe has two calcium binding sites, one here and one here. And the C lobe also has two calcium binding sites, one here and another here. And then there is a linker between the two lobes of the calmodulin, okay? And in apocalmodulin, this linker is a linear polypeptide. So it's just amino acid after amino acid after amino acid after amino acid after amino acid. Okay, and you can see that the whole structure of apocalmodulin then is sort of curved over like this. So it's kind of hunched over with the two lobes folded back towards one another. And uh, another little bit of nomenclature here. Uh, Apocalmodulin is often abbreviated to APO, and then people abbreviate calmodulin to uppercase C, lowercase a, uppercase M, like so. So apocalmodulin here. Right. Uh, so basically what can happen is four calcium ions can come along and one can bind in each of these uh, calcium binding sites. So a calcium can bind here, a calcium can bind here, a calcium can bind here, and a calcium can bind here. And what happens is that triggers a conformational change in the calmodulin. Firstly, the whole structure uh, straightens out basically. So it goes from being hunched over like this to the two lobes being uh, more sort of spread out. So they sort of 
move back out, basically. If you imagine that they're sort of bent over backwards, then they move back out. Now, this sort of straightening out of the whole structure of camogenin is in stark contrast to what's going to happen to this linker region here. Basically, that goes from being a linear polypeptide to taking on an alpha helical structure like so. Okay, right. Uh, and this is when there are four calciums bound in these calcium binding sites. So I will show these calciums as just green blobs, basically. So you've got a calcium here, calcium here, and a calcium here. Okay, and basically this structure that we now have where we've got calcium bound calmodulin, this is called a calcium calmodulin complex. Okay, and for short, calcium calmodulin complexes are abbreviated to CA2 plus for calcium and then calmodulin, capital C, lowercase a, uppercase n, cam like that. So calcium cam. Okay, so this is a calcium calmodulin complex. Right, uh, so what we now want to discuss is how we're going to use calmodulin uh, to have our adenylylcyclase 8 enzyme activated by calcium. So basically, on adenylylcyclase 8, you have a special domain uh, on this amino terminal bit prior to the transmembrane domain 1. So remember, this uh, cluster of six membrane spanning alpha helices is called transmembrane domain 1. Okay, and I'll colour this special domain in in pink here. And basically, this special domain is called a calmodulin recruitment domain. Okay, and basically what happens is apocalmodulin is going to bind to this calmodulin recruitment domain. Okay, so remember, apocalmodulin is the name for cal sorry is the name for calmodulin when it has no calcium bound to it. So let's just put our apocalmodulin here. Okay, now when calcium goes up in the cytoplasm around this adenylylcyclase 8, which now has the apocalmodulin bound to its cytoplasmic calmodulin recruitment domain here, what will happen? is this apocalmodulin will convert into a calcium calmodulin complex and then what happens is uh, the calmodulin recruitment domain transfers uh, the calmodulin from the calmodulin recruitment domain onto uh, the C2B region down here. Okay, so let me show this. So remember, the C2 domain was split into two separate domains. It was split into C2A and C2B here. And basically, what's going to happen is this calcium calmodulin, as it now is, is going to be transferred from the calmodulin recruitment domain to C2B. So what we'll end up with is a calcium calmodulin complex here bound to the C2B and that then promotes the dimerization of C2A with C1A which remember are the two domains which make the active adenylylcyclase. Okay, so basically the apocalmodulin binds to the calmodulin recruitment domain. Then when calcium binds to that apocalmodulin and converts it into a calcium calmodulin complex, the calcium calmodulin complex is transferred from the calmodulin recruitment domain to the C2B domain, and that then uh, promotes the dimerization of C1A with C2A. Okay, right. Um, now, there's a similar mode of activation by calcium for adenylylcyclase 1. However, it's not quite so fancy. In adenylylcyclase 1, what happens is if I just draw this, Okay, so let's just revise our structure of an adenylylcyclase once again. So here's the amino terminus. Then we have transmembrane domain 1, which consists of these six membrane spanning alpha helices clustered together. The C1 loop, then with transmembrane domain 2, and then the uh, C terminal tail, which has the C2 domain here, split into C2A and C2B. Okay, and basically in adenylcyclase 1, so let's say this is adenylcyclase 1, then uh, the apocalmodulin binds to C1B here. So this is C1B. 
okay? And uh, this is apocalmogenin at the moment. And then when calcium goes up in the cytoplasm, what will happen is calcium will bind there, it will convert into calcium calmogenin complex, and then it doesn't move this time. So it remains there, and then it also somehow promotes the dimerization of the C1A domain with the C2A domain. So basically, the principle here is that the adenyl cyclase 1 and the adenyl cyclase 8 do not have binding sites for calcium themselves. Instead, they have binding sites for calmodulin, and then the calmodulin has a binding site for calcium. So they detect calcium indirectly through the calmodulin. Okay, so there are some examples of the activation of these adenyl cyclase enzymes by calcium. And all of adenyl cyclase 1, adenyl cyclase 3, which we haven't discussed, and adenyl cyclase 8, they are all activated by calcium. Okay, so when calcium goes up, these enzymes go from the inactive state to the active state and start converting ATP to cyclic AMP and pyrophosphate. Now, a whole bunch of um, G-alpha subunits are capable of inhibiting um, the uh, activation of these adenyl cyclases, adenyl cyclase 1, 3, and 8, by calcium. Okay, so they will bind to adenyl cyclase 1, 3, and 8, and they will stop calcium from being able to activate those adenyl cyclases. So they do not inhibit the enzyme, they stop its activation. Okay, and that's a subtle point. Now, which alpha subunits are capable of doing this? Well, they're members of the G alpha I slash naught family. Now, the specific members which are capable of doing this are G alpha I 1 to 3, G alpha Z, and also G alpha O. Okay, so we've seen. Um, that the G alpha I slash naught family contains these eight alpha subunits, and five of them are going to be involved in blocking the activation of adenyl cyclase 1, 3, and 8 by intracellular calcium. So we've got G alpha I1, G alpha I2, G alpha I3, so all of the alpha I's. Uh, then we've also got G alpha Z and also G alpha O. Okay, so all of these, um, when they've got their alpha subunits on their own, so when they're on their own with GTP bound to them, okay, so remember these are all alpha subunits, okay, like so, and they've got GTP bound to them, so they've no longer got their beta gamma subunit with them. Basically, any of these five alpha subunits will go off and bind to adenyl cyclase 1, 3, 8, enzymes and they will block calcium from being able to activate them but they do not inhibit them they stop the activation of them and there's a subtle difference between that okay right so uh, that is the uh, inhibition of the activation of the calcium uh, activated adenyl cyclases okay so uh, what we're now going to turn our attention to is the inhibition of the calcium-inhibited adenyl cyclases. Okay, so remember there was the group 3 adenyl cyclases, which were G-alpha-I and also um, calcium-inhibited adenyl cyclases. So this is group 3. Okay, right. Uh, so, which adenyl cyclases were in group 3? Well, there was adenyl cyclase 5, and also there was adenyl cyclase 6. Okay, so I just want to discuss adenyl cyclase 5 and adenyl cyclase 6 uh, for a moment, and also I want to discuss how they're inactivated by calcium, and then we'll also discuss uh, which uh, G-alpha subunits are capable of inhibiting these. Okay, um, so calcium inhibition of these two isn't directly relevant to what we're talking about, but just for a complete story, I would like to talk about it. Okay, uh, it's interesting, nevertheless. Okay, so, basically, for this, we need to talk a little bit more in detail about how the C1A and C2A domains, when dimerized, actually catalyze the reaction of ATP being converted to cyclic AMP.
OK, so let's draw the active adenylyl cyclase here. So here's the carboxylic acid group, and here's the amino group. OK, and now we've got the C1A domain here, dimerized with the C2A domain here. OK, so here's C1A and here's C2A. And basically, at the centre of this active enzyme down here, you have an ion, a very important ion. OK, so I'll show this. This is really important for the function of this active enzyme. OK, and this is a magnesium ion. OK, right. And basically, uh, what this magnesium ion does is it brings in uh, the ATP, basically. So let me just remind you of the structure of ATP. So remember, ATP stood for adenosine triphosphate. Adenosine meant ribose bound to adenine. So here we have our adenine, here we have our ribose. And then it was adenosine triphosphate. So we need three phosphate groups off the side. Now, phosphate groups are negatively charged. OK, uh, so what basically happens is uh, these phosphate groups, when they're coming into the active size of this enzyme, they interact with this magnesium ion at the centre here, because the magnesium ion is a divalent cation. OK, so here it is. It's got two positive charges here. And basically, that's how you bring in the ATP into the active site, basically, and how you stabilize it there. Now, basically, after the conversion has occurred, so let me color in the magnesium ion as well, OK? After the conversion to from ATP to cyclic AMP and pyrophosphate has occurred, OK? So we've got our pyrophosphate here, and then we've got our cyclic AMP here. OK, so here's our uh, ribose again. Here is our alpha phosphate bound to the uh, alcohol group of the third carbon. And here is the adenine off the side. OK, so I'll colour things in. So I have the ribose sugar in blue here. OK, and then the phosphate group in pink here. And then the adenine organic base in turquoise. OK, basically... What has to happen is you have to somehow remove these molecules now, okay? And the problem is this pyrophosphate here, okay? Because that's still nicely bound to this magnesium ion here, okay? Um, so what will happen is the cyclic AMP will leave, but you have to do something to get rid of this pyrophosphate. So what happens is a conformational change in the enzyme occurs, and two um, amino acid residues come in here, and basically they barge the pyrophosphate out of the way. So basically, what the pyrophosphate is doing is you have one phosphate group and another phosphate group, which both have one center of negative charge, and these are binding with the magnesium ions. Basically, what you do is you bring in two amino acid residues and they barge the pyrophosphate out of the way and the pyrophosphate gets ejected. Now, here's the ingenious bit. Basically, well, it's not ingenious. It's, it's very, I find it quite amazing, but uh, it's bad for the adenylyl cyclase. What happens is if calcium goes up in the cytoplasm, what will happen is calcium will replace that magnesium ion at the center of the catalytic site. Now, what's the problem with calcium replacing that magnesium ion? It's a divalent cation as well. So you might think, well, maybe it's going to completely dis make the enzyme dysfunction, but it doesn't. Okay, it comes in. Now, calcium is below magnesium in the group 2 in the earth alkali metals of the periodic table, which means that it's bigger than magnesium, OK? Um, so you have this bigger ion now at the centre of the active site, and it does the first bit absolutely fine, OK? So it brings in the ATP molecule brilliantly. The problem is when you get to this ejection, OK? So it brings in the ATP molecule. The ATP molecule still gets converted to pyrophosphate and cyclic AMP. The problem is the cyclic AMP goes out fine, but the pyrophosphate binds to the calcium, just like it did with magnesium, OK? And then the same mechanism happens. The two amino acid residues come in to try and barge the pyrophosphate out of the way, 
and it doesn't work. Why? Well, basically, it's because the calcium's bigger. The calcium has a greater number of binding sites than magnesium does. So basically, if we look at magnesium, okay, so if this is our magnesium ion, magnesium ion has six sites where negatively charged ions can bind. There is one above it, one below it, and then four around it. So one, two, three, and then one behind it over there. So basically, it's got this sort of octagon, sorry, octahedron rather, around it like so. Okay. So it can overall coordinate six negatively charged groups. And the pyrophosphate molecule counts for two of these. So when the two uh, extra amino acid residues come in, they barge the pyrophosphate out the way, and the other four binding sites of the magnesium are already occupied. Those are what are holding the magnesium onto the enzyme, okay? So there's no binding sites left over, so pyrophosphate is barged out. The problem with calcium is that it's bigger. It has eight binding sites, okay? So its binding sites are in this sort of position, so they're the corners of the cube this time, rather than the corners of the octahedron that we saw for magnesium. Okay, so like so. So it can coordinate eight things, and this time four of those again will be to the enzyme, and will be holding the calcium attached to the enzyme. Two of them are then to the pyrophosphate, but then it's got two left over. So when the, uh, when the amino acid residues, the two amino acid residues, come to barge the pyrophosphate out, the pyrophosphate will say, hey, there's enough room here for all of us. So it doesn't get barged out. It just maybe moves a little, rearranges itself, and it is allowed to stay there. And that's not good, because whilst you have that pyrophosphate still there, the ATP, the next ATP molecule, can't come in then, because it's not going to come in when there's a pyrophosphate blocking its entrance. It needs uh, its beta and its gamma phosphate to bind to the calcium uh, cation. Uh, it's not... They can't bind if the pyrophosphate's still there. So, basically, the pyrophosphate inhibits the adenyl cyclase. So the adenyl cyclase, with a calcium ion at its uh, catalytic centre, uh, will catalyse one uh, reaction, and then it will be blocked forevermore, basically, until the calcium ion is lost, basically. Okay, so that is why these adenyl cyclase 5 and adenyl cyclase 6 uh, get inhibited by uh, calcium. And this doesn't happen for the other adenyl cyclases. Okay, so this is a phenomenon just for these group 3 adenyl cyclases. Now, uh, basically, these group 3 adenyl cyclases are also inhibited by uh, members of the G alpha I slash naught family. And the members of the G alpha I slash naught family of alpha subunits of heterotrimeric G proteins, which inactivate these group 3 adenyl cyclases, are again the G alpha I, so all three of them, so G alpha I1, G alpha I2, G alpha I3, and then finally also GZ, whoops, I've missed the alpha there, G alpha Z this should be. Okay, so let me just replace this one with G alpha I3. Okay, so all four of these alpha subunits, when they're on their own with GTP bound to them, like so up here, this alpha subunit with GTP bound to it, if it's one of these four, will be able to bind to adenyl cyclase 5 slash 6 enzymes, and they inhibit the enzyme, basically. Okay, so just like calcium blocks the activity of these enzymes, uh, G alpha I1, G alpha I2, G alpha I3, and G-alpha-Z will also block their activity. Okay, so these ones really do inhibit the enzyme rather than just blocking their activation like the G-alpha-I1, uh, like we saw in the uh, case of these group 1 adenyl cyclases. Okay, right. Uh, so, we'll continue this discussion in the next video where we'll talk about the involvement of beta-gamma subunits uh, in um, regulating adenyl cyclase activity.